Welcome to Beautiful Work, Beautiful Life. If you're new to us, we're so glad you're here. If you're a frequent listener, we love you so much. And thank you, thank you, thank you for being our support system and receiving us and being with us in this beautiful work, this inner work that we talk about. Today, we have a new guest to the show. We are so excited to welcome her today. And we're going to be talking about um, our topic is the value of leisure and play. And I just want to remind everybody, we're in a month of exploring your power, your inner power, your authentic power, your personal power. And we think that this topic is a beautiful healing um, method. It also is one that provides a lot of balance and so many other things. And so Deb is going to help us speak into that, but I'm going to turn it over to Laurel, my partner over there, so she can introduce Deb properly to our audience. Hi, Laurel. Hey. Hi, Laurel. How are you today? I'm good. I'm really good. So excited. Me too. It is yeah. my, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Deb Ayer. Um, Deb, Laurel, you know this, but our listeners don't yet. I've been working with Deb for maybe four years. Sounds about right. And mm -hmm. and and Deb is um, a network chiropractor. She is an energy goddess. I can say after four years, my soul is so much more present in my physical being than it was. Um, I have been um, going to network care for, I don't remember how long, but uh, maybe seven years now. It could be eight. I'm not really sure. Um, but Deb, I landed with Deb because she's in Dover, New Hampshire. She has a beautiful practice. Um, and it feels like home. I go every other week to see her. And I leave there so much lighter and so much more in touch with how I'm showing up, who I am. Um, and I just, my life would be very different if I had not crossed paths with Deb. And one little tidbit, now you may know this, Laurel, but Dover, where Deb's office is, where her practice is, is my hometown. It's the, it's the town I was born in. And so a few years ago, I was there one day on the table with her, it happened to be my mother's birthday. And I really was like, how beautiful is it to come home to oneself with the help of, of someone else in the town I was born in? Uh, so I, I just can't say enough about Deb. So, but I want you to tell us, Deb, a little bit more about your practice and what you do. And um, you've been doing this for a long time. A long time. <laughs> <laughs> You're not that old. How could it be that long? <laughs> First of all, thank you for having me on your, you know, this beautiful podcast and um, getting to meet you, Laurel, and obviously having such beautiful connection with you, Laurel. Um, so, you know, it's always an interesting thing of like how we tag who we are and what we've done. And so, you know, myself, like many of you have worn, I'm just going to give you a little side note that you may hear noises. And these are my pleasure, playful puppies in the background. And I used to try to hide it and I'm not going to, especially <laughs> this episode. Um, <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So it's just the real deal, right? It's, it's our life. It's our living and, and how we live. So so, you know, I have worn and I do wear many hats and I think it's an interesting thing to take our life's work and go, what is it that I do? So, you know, as you so beautifully said, and thank you for the beautiful kind words, um, they land ever so warm and snuggly in my heart. Um, you know, I, I, I've, I wear many hats. I'm a chiropractor. I have uh, learned extensively and taught and worked in international retreats doing this particular technology of embodiment in which only chiropractors are uh, at this point learn or can learn um, called Network Spinal. And it is very powerful access tool working through the neurology and, and really that interface between life around us. You know, I often say it's the invisible threads that actually are the guiding forces that also can become the gremlins when we are not in tune 
to them. And we're living in such a grind over, over information overload culture that our nervous systems are wrought with challenge in ways that we were not challenged in the past. It's like listening to a, a transistor, listening to life through a transistor radio. Those of you that don't know what a transistor radio is, it's, it was one where you can't really hear much. <laughs> like the tones, you, you don't know if it's a guitar or if it's a mandolin or, so it can be confusing to know what the right sort of response is if we can't hear or discern. And so part of my life's mission to ask you, you ask me what I do, it, it certainly lands way outside of the scope of being the chiropractor in my practice. As you may, you know, see Laurel, a lot of our conversations or even things we do, do have this foundation of network spinal that's very reproducible in its impact and really helping the nervous system move from this sort of fragmented, mm, you know, transistor radio experience to more of the Bose stereo system where the nervous system can regain access to more discernment and more subtle cues. Um, but I've also been influenced by many other things, you know, and have um, along my career or along my service path really have been um, inspired to look at women out there doing what they're doing and how are they accessing, you know, um, different embodiment in ways that maybe I can't get from my male mentors. And so I've had really powerful male mentors and female mentors. And, you know, I think that to say I'm a chiropractor, I'm a mother, I'm a speaker, I'm a retreat, you know, um, offer and all these things and that you know have had incredible opportunities to help other agents of cha change people out in the world and leaders because they so value that access that ability to get the subtle cues which then amplifies their capacity to serve at a much more impactful in a much more impactful way you know i think i boil it down to i was thinking about this this morning i think i'm just like simply a love muse for <laughs> the power of sacred embodiment as a form of liberation mm -hmm. and individual Beautiful. and collective because I truly believe, and I just was hearing somebody, um, an author named Trisha Hersey, and literally she, there in her manifesto, rest is resistance. Um, I, it literally said, you know, the body is that access to liberation. I'm like, that's, that's it. That's what I've been saying for years. That's the way through. That's the way into um, a cracking this sort of, train of of like how we go 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 and we have to get more and more and more efficient so yeah. that's kind of what i am and what i do and there's many forms and vehicles in which i do it in so hopefully that answers uh, and yeah, i've been doing that was 30 so years I've been a chiropractor i've had my practice for 28 but you know again those are just some of the those are some of the ways in which i do do the things oh, yeah, go ahead. Be go ahead. Before we jump into this topic, which, you know, when we were talking about leisure and play, um, I I thought of you, right? And um, your practice, we haven't mentioned the name of it, but I want to share with our listeners, Wellspring Center for Wellbeing in Dover, New Hampshire. And we'll put your contact information in our show notes um, because, you know, it really has the way that you work and the way you embody play and pleasure. Um, I just didn't, I knew that you would be a perfect guest for us today to come in and talk about this topic. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah so, so Deb, I, I, I really, I have so many questions for you. I, I know I won't get them all in, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put one out there so we can get started on uh, like the specifics here, so to speak. So. As I was listening to you, I was thinking about how many, you know, listeners to the show um, may or may not relate to nervous system talk and energy talk. And, and if, if you feel like you, you aren't schooled in that enough, you know, just just listen in, get what you can, 
listen to some more, you know, over time, I feel like for me, my education came one conversation at a time, one treatment at a time, one, you know, like you, you, you gather, it's a whole body and world of information to understand. And a whole, to me, a whole portal of understanding your health, that's so empowering. So our invitation is always to, you know, invite yourself to the table to, to play in this world with us. So that being said, can you, can you share just a little bit of how you see leisure and play affecting the nervous system? That's one part of my question. The other part is, in our culture today, do you think people really understand what leisure and play is? And if not, could you help us get back on track a little? <laughs> I'd be happy to. Okay, so there's a two part question there. And and I think I'll just initially say that I truly believe that play, leisure, laughter are the truly expressions of activism that poke holes through our capitalistic grind culture. And so they're kind of you know, it, it, it meaning they poke holes because they're not um, supportive of grind culture. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yet, if I asked you, do you ever feel exhausted or do you know a friend who's ever felt exhausted, overwrought with fear, worried, anxious, depressed? I'm going to be bold and say that 100% of us can say yes. We either, if we do not relate personally, we can relate to somebody we love. And so I think that you asked the question, how does play affect the nervous system? It, it literally, you know, we talk about the, the other thing I would say is that we all know somebody, if not ourselves, that has some kind of sensitivity, digestive challenges. Um, hormonal imbalances. These are epidemics. These are the real epidemics. And I think that that is because our nervous systems, our bodies are overwrought with noise and fragmentation because they can't keep up. So there's something called fight or flight. We're going to keep it really simple. Most of you probably have heard of fight or flight, but fight or flight is something that we have in our nervous system. That's really important. It keeps us safe. So if somebody, um, you know, swerves in front of you quickly, you want to have a fight or flight response. You don't want to ask them out for tea and say, I wonder how they're feeling, why they went over to my lane. You want to react. And so that react reaction saves your life. The challenge with how we live today, to, to answer your question, is that we the, the whole sort of effect of fight or flight is to save our life and then go back into harmonium or go back into a harmonious state within our nervous system, within our systems, within our body, within the orchestra of functionality in our body, that things you don't even think about. But living in today's culture, we never really get the, the moment or the time to go back into harmony. So we have this other sort of mutated version of fight or flight that either brings our nervous system into vigilance, hypervigilance, hypersympathetic reaction, where we become highly anxious, we can't quite settle. Um, our mind is always going, but it's fragmented, we can't get clear, or we're completely like checked out or numb and our systems don't have enough energy and we still can't think clearly. Um, and, you know, it's like we can't even feel fear because we're just so numbed out. And these are the epidemic sort of responses that happen to our bodies physically, which impact our body's physical cellular ability to heal emotionally, which give us the emotions, give us the range to be able to navigate our world internally and externally, mentally, how we can organize thoughts and even how we can see a bigger moment, how we can see the forest for the trees. And never mind, it also kind of in it, it doesn't kind of it absolutely impacts our capacity to connect to higher sources, you know, whatever your divinity is. And so play interrupts and disrupts this pattern.
It literally changes hormones. It literally changes what your nervous system is able to experience and therefore creates a pattern interrupt to everything I just mentioned. Mm. Which leads me to your second question, like, I forget exactly how you asked it, um, is how do you think people know how to, what was your question? I know I said in our culture today, do you think people really understand what leisure and play really right. is? And it's, it's a fantastic question because in order to be a good citizens of, citizen of the world, we um, have been enculturated to feel worthy based on how much we can produce. That is capitalism, yeah. right? Yeah. And we're not gonna get into all the things, but we're gonna keep it simple right now that to be the good citizen, we must be serious enough to get shit done because we are worthy in direct proportion to how much we can produce. Now, the challenge with that is it's not sustainable. Hence all the challenges and diseases and fraught nervous systems and health conditions we have. I think it's directly related. And so when you ask the question, like, do we know what that means? <clears throat> do we have an organic human, like part in our humanity within our being that knows what play is? Absolutely. Is it covered up by noise? And is it in direct conflict with producing or what we think is producing? Yes. So, <clears throat> you know, it's like, think about raising our kids, like, stop playing around, you know, I let's know. get serious. Come on. <laughs> we need to get serious. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because play can be very hard because what happens with this noise in our nervous systems, our nervous systems in general have gotten a lot more rigid. And what I mean by that is its capacity to feel life to be able to navigate life is much more rigid. How much we can take in is less. How much we can digest literally <clears throat> is less. And so we protect ourselves and we try to stay away from things and we try to <clears throat> get off of social media, hopefully, but then we're secretly addicted because we're looking for those hormones that are imbalanced and we wanna get a little dopamine rush, which lasts, as we know, for about two seconds. And yeah. so play, even though it's, it's something natural, it is against how we've been indoctrinated. So there's the, therein lies the conflict. And I will just say this, if you just go, you know what? You should take a nap. Oh, you should like, you should dance around. Initially, we can have resistance to that mm -hmm. because our nervous systems, meaning our bodies don't have flex and don't remember what that is. So it's going to feel awkward or counterproductive, like it's going to take us off track. And I'm boldly saying it's completely the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I want to, yeah, oh, go ahead, Laurel, and then I'll come I was going to say, I, it's so interesting. Um, one of the exercises I assign to my clients, you know, the one of the very first things I do with them is what brings you joy. And most people can't answer that question. I know. And um, I have one client, a young woman in New York City, who I, I assigned her five minutes of dancing in your living room every day. And it changed how she felt about her day. You know, and so I love that you're talking about it might feel really uncomfortable for us to play because we have forgotten how. Mm -hmm. Our body isn't even used to that feeling or the sensation of lightness of being. So I love that you brought that up. Mm. Yeah. Here's one of the things that's coming up for me that I want to make sure that we talk about in the show or you, or you speak into a little bit from your, your uh, professional, you know, viewpoint. So in my view, a lot of people today think of being involved in sports as a chance for leisure and play. I think it has its place, but I also feel like if you're going into that activity in a really competitive manner, is it really leisure and play ultimately for you? <laughs> well, I, I love that you're asking this question because it came up in my being when, when I knew we were going to talk about this. And so I don't think there's a black and white answer. However, yeah. I think that 
our sports, our education, our, all of these things are steeped in capitalism. So I think the part that you're getting at is that it's performance driven. And it's not that we don't want to be high performers in the things that connect us to our passion. It's just that if that is directly connected to our self-worth, then is it really, I think play gives us an access to listening differently. Mm. And I'm pausing because like when we're performing, we're, our energy is going out. We're pushing that energy out and we're going towards something. Mm -hmm. I think that if we can look at play in a more unorthodox way of not performing, but as listening, as giving our bodies permission to listen differently, move differently, breathe differently, then it changes completely. So I really can resonate with what you're saying. And again, if someone feels that rush it's fantastic but i think anything that becomes habitual and we're not like hacking into it with a present awareness and we're not bringing some novelty and how we go about it i think it becomes more reactive and habitual than really a tool to hack into listening and settling the yeah. system I feel like what it was speaking into too, Deb, as you were sharing was I was I was connecting the dots of when you were talking about this rigidity in our nervous spinal you know system area, right? That how you approach it is either going to give you flexibility or it's going to increase the rigidity. And so uh, even to be able to begin to sense for yourself, I mean, I think this is one of the beautiful things about embodiment work is you come back into your power of sensing for yourself these things that we're talking about and so you get to empower yourself with your own wisdom rather than having to have somebody else tell you oh now your nervous system is relaxing i can see that on this biofeedback machine you know um and and so you know thank goodness there are people like you that can help us bridge that space of coming back into ourselves more wholly and more fully and and help guide us into you know ideas and ways of being that will allow us to be more present in our bodies and be more flexible i think mm -hmm. that that's the key yeah definitely. yeah it really is you know uh thank you and it's it's a it is truly a pleasure and you know i'm as in my journey as i have become more playful embodied in a greater range like it's like using all the apps on my phone versus like like really having utilization of the aspects of who i am come through here and there's many parts in which we live day to day that don't allow us to hack into parts of ourselves so we forget about them you know is kind of what you're saying and so i was thinking about this the other day of um Halloween and in one of these Halloweens years ago, I dressed up like a 70s go-go dancer, like white boots and everything. So good. <laughs> and what I what I'm why I'm sharing this way as a hack to play is that in that day and that night, I was I became a 70s go-go dancer. I danced in ways that were super amazing that I never, like I moved my bodies in the, the my bodies, all of them. In all these <laughs> ways, I was like having so much fun. I was more confident. I was like, what is happening? Like I just, all this gave me is permission. And as I put on another hat or a version, right? As I was quote unquote pretending, I inadvertently found a place within me. I woke up a place I woke up that go go dancer in me. And yeah. if we don't play, we don't visit parts of ourselves, and we're exhausted, or we're anxious, like this is, this is physiologically a fact. Yeah. You know, and so it really is realizing or at least being willing to realize that there is value that play actually wakes up more of us and therefore allows us to have more of us come to the plate of the things that we're wanting to produce in life. So in actuality, we become more efficient, not less efficient when we play. Right. right. I love, I almost felt like I wanted to like connect the dots with, 
uh, play puts you in the mode of being the great creator and then there you you can't be a manifester without being a creator right like those two things like people want to bypass that and just be like i'm going to use my head and i'm going to manifest this thing it's like oh, wait a minute what about the what about the second chakra and the first chakra yeah, <laughs> like, about the neck it? down yeah. it's really what it is like yeah, what's right? the body you want what's the body do yeah. and giving yeah. your body the permission to act out like what if you were saying you want to manifest something and you ask yourself what does this move like in my body? If I want to manifest a podcast talking about play, why don't I take five minutes to move my body and what it feels like, moves like, breathes like to do a podcast on play? You know what I mean? Like we don't, like what you're saying, our creative nature, the creatrix that we are of life itself, that's what we are made of. We are made of stardust and creation gets blocked when we want to like you said kind of reroute and we're not alone we're we're, we're taught this we're taught that mm -hmm. to value that more than the other part and then we find ourselves going blank and feeling not like we're not in our creative flow and feeling self-judgment and it's this kind of vicious cycle yeah yeah Laurel, I'm going to give you a chance to jump in before I jump I, in again because I can't hold myself <laughs> back today <laughs> I'm so glad I'm learning so much you know, I just, I love, um, I love the distinction of performance, right? And that really, really resonated with me because it is true. And with my corporate background, you know, everything that we do from a very young age is to meet expectations, to perform to an external, whatever it might be, the, you know, the panel of judges externally. And um, what was coming up for me when we were talking about the creativity piece is, now Laurel knows the story, but I did a paint night. It was um, at another, at um, Love Light Illuminations, which is an energy practice um, center in Wells, Maine. And um, they had a, a paint night that was tied to some energy work. My painting was so rigid and so controlled because it was coming from my head not from my heart right and so watching that in myself and watching you know how others came to the canvas in full out play was so remarkable for me so um i think you know our listeners i'm right there with you learning how to play and get rid of the performance and judgment um, you know, the the audience full of judges. Um, it's so important to be able to feel what your body, you know, needs wants to bring. To yeah. yeah, wants to do. May I just All right. that? Yeah. If it feels, like, just to go back to, I think this is important. If it goes, you're going to feel awkward. If this is something that has not been a thing for you. In fact, we are, you know, we're kind of taught not to trust our bodies. So we're saying, hey, a hack is trust your body. So I just really want to acknowledge for those listeners that go, uh, you know, I don't know, like start with something slow. Start with just putting your hands on your chest or giving yourself a hug, closing your eyes, slow breathing in your nose and out your mouth, and maybe just allow something that feels soothing and slowly start to move your body on your timing. It can, it, you know, you don't have to like go straight to Beyonce, you know, or whatever it is for you. It's like, give yourself permission to just show up for your body and know that it's been longing for you and that you're not alone and that, that it's okay, however it feels. And that, you know, your body has so much for you and it does not judge you for judging it. It is your sacred expression. It is what you are living through. And I truly believe our body is sort of like this, um, this movie projector of our life. So when we go to that painting, you know, Donnie Epstein, who's the founder of Network Spinal, would say the shape, tone, and position of your, your spine is directly related to the shape, tone, and position of your life. 
And so in that moment, that painting gave you a real clear picture of like, wow, I like to be compliant. I like to draw on the lines. I want to be a good girl, you know, and you saw it. And, you know, I think there's all of that, you know, within us. And so giving yourself just little changes, starting off slow, if that feels, you know, more comfortable and safe for you, I think is important to note. Well, I will take your advice because I was thinking I'm going to go buy a pair of go-go boots. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, I want to expand on that idea. I, was, <laughs> I know, right? Because uh, because um, when Deb was talking about it, she was saying, you know, one Halloween, right? And I was thinking about my daughter who um, started doing like wig parties with their friends. And it wasn't a Halloween, necessarily a Halloween experience, right? And I got this one video once where she was, she and they all did, um, they were all, older people um i think they were all older people and so they had like gray wigs and and she dressed up like in a like a muumu kind of outfit old lady's dress right and they were all embodying what they thought like older people looked like and talked like and the video was hysterical because it looked so real right their bot their beings for whatever reason were like loose enough flexible their spinal their nervous system were like yeah we can go into this state really easy right and doing it and that was such a, such a lesson to me like in play like how relaxed and loose you have to become to allow yourself to just go into that you know it's because it's your imagination right whatever you think an old person moves like talks like look like <laughs> dresses like right <laughs> Yeah. 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 So fun. Yeah. And I think that, you know, if it's hard to access your own play, it's okay to yeah. put on a moment and act it out, like yeah. act it out. This is in your home. If there's somebody that, you know, if you know somebody that you really, that's a mentor that, that you really love and, and, um, that are inspiration, like pretend to be them for a moment. Yeah, this is not yeah, getting yeah. less yourself. It's just a hack into yourself, right? Yeah. So giving it, it really becomes like a permission. And I think that there is something, at least initially, when we can pretend to be someone else, it gives us a little bit more um, availability that maybe if we're feeling stuck in perspective within our own being, it, it moves us away from that uh, for a moment but we're still hacking into ourselves because that's right. a, you're still hacking into yourself because you're using yeah. it to do it. One of my theories, Deb, tell me what you think about this. This is my, this is my own theory. One of my <laughs> theories is if you're, if you're really envious of somebody that it's only because it, that you're seeing in them a part of you that you haven't been able to develop and, and express fully yet. And so I love that. I almost feel like that's a method of doing that. 100 percent finding that 100 yeah. percent what what irks us what we're envious of are all is always uh igniting a part of us that's been less expressed less loved less nurtured and so i i couldn't 100 100 percent agree yeah. yeah so that's a great that's a great invitation to all our everybody listening to the podcast today is find the person that you still really admire that you almost you, you don't have to completely envy them you can just admire them and be like oh i wish i was more like them if you say that then be them like play with being them and find out how you are them in your own way right whatever qualities those are they are in you. And now this is an opportunity to grow them, express them, embody them fully. Yeah. And absolutely. hopefully enjoy <laughs> them. Our yeah. humanity is all bound together, right? And so when we share our stories, when we see others, we're seeing parts of ourselves. And we can either use our energy to block that, to talk about, to commiserate, to feel crappy about ourselves, or we can go, you know what? I'm seeing a part of me that's actually like even recognize if you're feeling envious or jealous or you want to say something about somebody before you do that pause and ask yourself what part in me is wanting more for me what part of me is wanting to be accessed oh I love that for shadow work we're going to break away from our play and leisure just for a second to give a really special announcement for shadow work. 
Deb, yeah. would you please repeat that? <laughs> yes. I feel like people really are into shadow work, but they're confused. They don't really understand and they don't understand how to do the work. And I feel like that is a beautiful, how you described that was spot on. Do you remember what you said? I'm I, I think for not being able to repeat 100%, but I will go I know, in. Yeah. I yeah. love my shadow. Yeah, basically <laughs> that, you know, the next time, if you can just recognize the next time you feel, feel polarization, you feel, um, you know, jealous or envious and you want to commiserate and you want to talk about another person, pause and ask yourself, what part of me is longing to be known more felt more nurtured more and just pause it can feel scary but that's what's happening is every time we feel that charge that charge is calling us home but if we constantly bring the energy outside of ourselves we are literally ignoring those parts of ourselves so I'm just going to pause. I'm not going to hurry into anything because I really want people to take that in. To me, that is so essential to this recovery, embodiment, relaxing, growing flexibility. Like there's all the things that we talked about today is what part of me needs more of my attention, right? And then is seeking also to be witnessed as well, right? Not only maybe by me, but by others. Yeah. Yeah. So, good. so beautiful. Oh. Laurel, have you got some final questions for Deb before we let her go? I know we've capitalized her time even more than we said we would. <laughs> I don't. I just love this topic. And maybe maybe one question is, I mean, you gave us some tips on starting small, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when you think about... Um, play you know how anything else that comes up that we can be doing um i mean i i know the things i do much of which have been brought out by the work i do with you and feeling into my body and feeling what part of my body is calling for me and or which is expressing maybe some pain or tightness but anything else that you can think of of how how to start creating you know, more leisure and play within the, and I don't want to say life because life, we always think we have more time maybe, right? Mm -hmm. But how can we make it part of our day to day? No, I think there's, that's a very valuable question because you can listen to a podcast like this and go, yeah, but cool, but I have deadlines and I have things. And so I oh, think yes. that, it's important to realize unless you're going to move to an island way out off grid, we need like quick hacks, right? We need like, how can we, how can we start um, in bringing this into our life? So one would be like, you know, I talked about emotion earlier and, you know, our emotions like to hang out on our digestion and our immune system. So sometimes even putting your hand on your belly and no matter how fake it feels, having like a 30 second bring a breath in exhale out of your mouth and then you're going to do a 30 second uncontrollable ridiculous obnoxious laughter <laughs> we won't do 30 seconds right now but it's 30 seconds of your life <laughs> it's 30 seconds of your life what it's 30 seconds of your life yeah. can completely change a moment now the other thing that you brought up, Laurel, is witness. And I really am a huge um, supporter of when we witness others, it, it, it literally completely impacts us and imprints differently. And we expand that liberation. And so I think that if you have um, a liberation partner, a play partner, and you go, hey, I've got five minutes, let's get on and we're gonna dance a song together. Boom, you pick a five minute song, a four minute song. Okay, love you, bye. And that that's a real easy, fast, quick. Um, can you schedule, you know, dance parties for yourself? You know, can you, you know, I do this with myself. Can you look in the mirror and just start moving your face around and go, okay, <laughs> I'm going to start every morning just moving my face around and seeing what I can do. 
And suddenly we're like, I am nutty. And it's like, yes, I am. Thank God. I'm bringing my playful back. You know, we're bringing our playful back. And so these are just really easy things. Like, and, you know, how can you even flirt with? And when I use the word flirt, I mean flirt in so much broader bandwidth as we, you know, sort of are enculturated. Can we flirt with life a little more? You know, when you're ordering something, maybe you're ordering a coffee at a cafe and you just say something really sweet or playful, you know, and can you just like wink at somebody and go, you know, can you be playful in a moment, even with a stranger? These are things that are so accessible and so, and they deliver so much to our doorstep when we do. So there's just a few things um, that you can do. And um, there's there's plenty more, but those are the, the some of the fast, you know, playful ones. Yeah, it is great. so good. It it reminds me when I work with my clients and I they don't know what brings them joy and how to play. I ask them to think about when they were kindergarten age, before they were six years old, because we play as children, and we have huge imaginations and a lot of creativity, and somehow. I think the key is when, like you said, the performance, when we start, when we're at an age where life is about performing well so that we can get to the next performance, we lose that ability. And um, you both know I spend a lot of time at the ocean and I started going in the ocean again a few years ago, just going to jump waves. And my daughters who are now adults said to me, you never jumped waves with us when we were kids. You know, and so it really was this whole thing of, no, I need to be able to be frolicking in the ocean and having fun and playing. Mm -hmm. um, it makes me feel so alive, right? And so it is really, I think, laughing at yourself in the mirror, you know, dancing, having a dance party, even if it's on Zoom with a friend, all of those are just such great tips for us. Thank you. Absolutely. I I love the holding your belly and laughing for 30 seconds. I think it's so cool because even for, for people, it's like, can you even do that? Right? Yeah. It's almost like a challenge. And if you can't do 30, start with 10 and work your way up. <laughs> we dare you. Yeah, we dare you. absolutely. <laughs> I remember, you know, there's also a lot of self-judgment that happens. And this is another kind of yeah, mirror exercise. I, I remember doing a... a talk years ago it was probably like 20 years ago and i thought i did a crappy job now this is a free workshop i'm given all my you know but i had kind of a heckler in that at that time and i got home and there was all this self-judgment i just looked in the mirror and i was like yeah you know what you're doing this free workshop because you're an idiot you are so stupid and i just started saying all the most <laughs> ridiculous things where i started to cry and then i couldn't stop laughing because i was like <laughs> believe that you're doing this and giving this service because you hate people because you're bad because you, you know i just i i just went to the extreme and it was um it was very powerful <laughs> it was very powerful I love it. so i love it that's yeah. so great that's so great deb we cannot thank you enough for giving us your time today and sharing with our listeners on this topic i um I hope if we invite you back, you'll come back and talk more energy stuff too, because we could use like more chitter chatter on that here on the podcast, big time. <laughs> and you're a wealth of information over there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. it's fun yeah. And I just want to say right now, I'm going to make a, a commitment that if I ever move to New Hampshire, you are, you can find me at Deb's office. I'll be making <laughs> appointments on the regular, okay? <laughs> because I wouldn't miss out on that for one minute. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So appreciate you. So appreciate Laurel's connection with you that brought you here today, that also brought your voice out to our listeners and uh, helping them, supporting them and doing their inner work, their beautiful work to make their lives more beautiful. Thank beautiful. you, Deb. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. We'll be back for more beautiful work, beautiful life next week. Bye. So nice to be Bye with you. Now. Bye.